we are already on to session two, food cities addressing the dual burden of malnutrition. And we will be beginning with a lovely little video. Good How are you? Hello. Lovely How to see you? you. Welcome to Hillstone Primary. Have a seat. So, we've got a menu. Right, I'd like to start with um, educating children to taste. Yeah, I mean, um, what we want from our children when they leave Hillstone in year six is to have a good basic knowledge of food, be able to cook nutritious meals and uh, to know where the food comes from. I work with um, children also through the role I do and sometimes they don't even recognise what a carrot is if it <laughs> isn't cooked. So how do you encourage that, Matthew? Well, we, we take a whole school approach. So uh, we've managed to embed a really positive food culture. We make food fun. We make it tasty. It's so that, that children want to eat it. It's amazing. It's not taught in our schools how... You know, the food that we eat on the table has been grown, packaged, processed. We're not taught really about the food cycle. And I think by giving young people sort of like the agency to make their own food, they're cooking it, they're growing it, they're planting seeds, they're, you know, they're in an environment where food is appreciated. Sometimes with our young people, if we start them on very poor quality food, the mm. fact is that they go through life and that is the type of food yeah. that they eat. neighbourhoods we appreciate food you know on our tables there's you know dinner tables where families come and sit together it's time that you talk to people around you it's you know food is always a happy time in my household it's only when you start to go to other places you actually realise what a fantastic place we live in and how lucky we are do you not think Birmingham is a rich mix of different cultures you've got the Chinese quarter you've got the Asian the Balti quarter there is over a hundred different cultures mm -hmm. in the city it is mixing between the cultures mm -hmm. and now on a Friday where the English culture would have fish and chips mm -hmm. they now have a Balti you know yeah. it's a curry how do you feel that with the role that you have you are influencing the future generations promotion of a sort of more plant-based diet. I think that's important for the planet. I think it's important for, for young people, definitely. a long way in terms of other cool cities we we've, you know now we're developing a food system strategy and Birmingham Community Council is obviously doing a lot of work on that and there's so much happening and it's just how can we connect the dots how can we make sure that a lot of the work that's been done around the city is brought in in a collaborative effort so that we can build a stronger you know food movement in Birmingham as um, a city council, what we've tried to do is not just keep it in Birmingham. We've actually worked with um, countries where we've looked at what they've been doing, what they've been doing around their food systems. We've also been doing some work on the Food Cities 2022. We've worked with people to actually put together a strategy which is co-produced and will cover a number of areas where we have challenges at the moment. I'd like to say well done for what you're trying yeah. to do at the school and we need to emulate that in mm -hmm. other places in the city but also as someone who's passionate about food yeah. you actually show in the way because over many years I've been on an allotment and I've mm -hmm. chaired an allotment site you don't see many young people but they're starting to come yeah. so food is something that you have to educate people about. I asked both of you to uh, send me a recipe for a meal. I'm going to go and cook that now. We're going to enjoy eating it. 
I was thinking of a meal that a child would have if they could grow and make their own food at school. This is something that we have on our school menu and it's a great way to get kids to eat whole grains. One, the trip we took to Pune, they gave me this sweet and sour chicken and it just tasted <laughs> heavenly. <laughs> How lovely. Um, yeah, I think a round of applause, absolutely. So nice to see what's going on just down the road at Hillstone Primary School. And the mention of Balti actually reminds me I must get a Balti pie before I leave Birmingham, adding that to my to-do list. Now, this session is called Food Cities Addressing the Dual Burden of Malnutrition. And it's about nutrition and how city leaders can help ensure that their citizens have access to good, nutritious food and affordable food that protects their health and also allows children to thrive. Now, nutrition challenges are multiple and they're global. On the one hand, we have people who are experiencing undernutrition, and in the same breath, we have millions more suffering from obesity and associated diseases. And these problems are particularly stark when people have moved from rural areas where they were eating more wholesome, whole and traditional foods, and they migrate to urban areas and they start to eat more processed foods. And these challenges affect cities in all corners of the globe. And in this session, we're going to hear how Rajkot in the Northwest Indian state of Gujarat, Birmingham here in the UK are grappling with these issues. But to begin, I'm next going to introduce the Right Honourable Amanda Milling MP, who we're delighted to have here, who is the Minister for Asia and the Middle East at the Foreign Office, Commonwealth at the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office, the FCDO. And we are particularly grateful for the support that the FCDO has given to Food Cities 2022 network since its inception and the ongoing advice and support that the civil service team have provided. The Right Honourable Amanda Milling MP. Thank you very much, Leila, and good morning to everyone, and a particular good um, kind of welcome to the West Midlands from a West Midlands MP. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be joining you this morning. I'm really pleased that you're joining us as part of the Commonwealth Games as well. And elite athletes are participating in these games. You know, good nutrition is really important to their performance, but that obviously that is important to for everyone. And with poor nutrition preventing too many people from achieving their potential, it's right that we're using these games as a springboard to accelerate work to tackle this. And um, as I say, I'm a West Midlands MP. My constituency, uh, Cannock Chase, is just up the road. In fact, I'm very pleased that we're hosting the mountain biking next week. But I know that many of you today have travelled from much further afield. And so it's really great to see so many of you from the Commonwealth family. And we're all united in our shared determination to end malnutrition. And so that's why I really do welcome the, this meeting that we're holding today. And it's a really great opportunity to learn from one another and to work even more closely towards this goal. But there's no doubting the scale of the challenge. We want... We all want our people, societies and economies to fulfil their potential and, and to be able to cope with the shocks that life can present. And it's impossible when the spectre of malnutrition is stalking lives and snatching away opportunities. We all want our children to benefit from decent education, for our families to enjoy good health and better incomes, and for our economies to thrive. But that's not going to happen unless there is a bedrock of good nutrition. 
In high-income countries, obesity, diet-related diseases and food bank use have rocketed over recent decades. Many in low- and middle-income countries are also facing the rising rates of obesity, yet this is coupled with persistently high rates of undernutrition, which contributes to almost half of all deaths amongst children under five. Up to eight in ten children in these countries are living mainly on staples like maize and, or rice, without access to fruit, vegetables and other nutritious foods. This is an awful situation and it's been kind of intensified by the triple whammy of world crises, COVID-19, climate change and conflict, including Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine. Lives and livelihoods are being shattered and the need for action is absolutely clear. And it's in the face of these challenges that we must strengthen our resolve and step up our commitment. We must make nutrition an integral part of our development, health, economic and environmental strategies. This is the only way that we can respond to the current crises and the future threats. And that's why the uh, UK Foreign Development and um, <laughs> I've done exactly the same, <laughs> FCDO, um, has committed to spend at least £1.5 billion by 2030 on interventions to improve nutrition right across all of our aid work. And this includes health programmes, humanitarian assistance, work to protect climate and nature, to boost agriculture and to promote economic development. And this is an essential part of our strategy to improve global health and end preventable deaths of mothers, babies and children by the end of this decade. There are three key areas I'd like to focus on today in terms of our work to strengthen global nutrition. And the first of these is our life-saving efforts to tackle acute malnutrition in children. This affects more than 47 million under fives and is projected to rise to 60 million this year. We're working with UNICEF on an innovative new 30 million pound partnership to prevent and treat this deadly form of malnutrition, which can turn common childhood illnesses into deadly diseases. And this includes piloting new treatments in the form of ready to use therapeutic foods. These provide the exact dose of nutrients needed to enable a child to recover effectively. And we're also addressing food insecurity through our wider humanitarian work. One of the largest aid donors globally, the UK is driving more effective approaches to crisis prevention, preparedness and response. Our support includes £49 million in emergency humanitarian assistance for the Horn of Africa, £88 million for Yemen, and £286 million for Afghanistan, all of which are facing severe food insecurity crises. The second element is about improving food systems. At, at the moment, not only are we failing to deliver nutrition for all, they're also responsible for up to a third of global greenhouse gases, uh, gas emissions, and are a major cause of biodiversity loss. And our efforts to tackle climate and nutrition challenges must be joined up. Addressing the impact that the food chain has on climate and nature while making nutritious foods more affordable and accessible. This is our focus when we invest in sustainable agricultural development. One great example of this, of, our, of this and our support to the fruits and vegetables for sustainable healthy diets initiative in collaboration with the World Vegetable Centre. This will boost sustainable production and consumption on climate resilient fruit and vegetables in Asia, helping to make nutritious foods more accessible and affordable. We also encourage food companies to invest in healthier products and to reduce their impact on climate and the environment. And thirdly, the valuable partnership with our co-hosts today, the Food Foundation, in helping cities across the Commonwealth to improve food systems and diets. 
We've been supporting the Food Cities 2022 initiative since its launch. Cities have such an important a role to play, not only because of growing populations, but because they are the key sources of inspiration for national action. And leaders from 20 cities in Bangladesh, India, Kenya, Malawi, Namibia, and South Africa, as well as here in Birmingham, have developed different ways to address the challenges of malnutrition, COVID-19, and climate change. And it's great to see so many of you here today. In India's Eat Smart Cities, public health campaigns and school action groups are encouraging people to make sustainable and nutritious food choices. And in South Africa and Malawi, cities are growing more food and reducing waste, then by making nutritious foods more affordable and available. We know that we, only can, we can only overcome the nutrition challenge and all the other challenges that are linked to it if we learn from each other and work together. But of course, I, you know, I cannot end without addressing Putin's illegal, barbaric war in Ukraine, which is having such a terrible impact on some of the most, world's most vulnerable people. This, this includes its devastating impact on food security. There was a, a welcome breakthrough in talks last week to resume grain exports from key Ukrainian Black Sea ports. That agreement must now be implemented. We've been working closely with the Ukraine government and other partners to facilitate exports of grain from Ukraine by sea, rail and road to help alleviate pressure on global food prices. And at, at Chogham, uh, the Chogham meeting last month, our Prime Minister announced £372 million package of support for countries hit hardest by rising global food costs and short, shortages of fertiliser. So this gathering today in this wonderful city of Birmingham, I'm sure you all agree, um, is really a timely one. We face many shared challenges, but together we have the strength, the expertise and the commitment to take them on. And I look, really look forward to hearing more about the fantastic achievements food cities have notched up all over the Commonwealth. This is a val really valuable opportunity to learn from one another and reiterate our commitment to work together to make a kind of safe, sustainable and nutritious foods available for everyone. Finally, I would like to thank uh, DIT and the Food Foundation for bringing us together today in UK House. And I wish all the cities who are represented today the very, much, the very best of success. Thank you. Um, yes, please take a seat. We're not socially distancing at the moment. But. <laughs> um, thank you so much to Amanda there. Poor nutrition prevents people from fulfilling their full potential. Malnutrition stalking lives. Nutrition must be an integral part of strategies and it was fantastic to hear from Amanda the work that's going on around these. And also, cities are key sources for inspiration for national action, which reflects what Dr. David said earlier. So it's just so great that we have so many cities here. I hope you're already feeling empowered. So welcome to the first panel discussion of the day. Um, I'm delighted to be joined by Mr. Amit Arora, Commissioner from Rajkot in India. And I've also got Dr. Justin Varney, Director of Public Health here in Birmingham. Thanks both for joining me. Um, how has your morning been so far? Brilliant. Excellent. Yeah. Amazing and we've only part. just begun. <laughs> so imagine Day what's one. coming. Yeah. Um, I think, Mr. Aurora, I'll start with you. So, 
India is becoming the most populous country in the world. And the prevalence of overweight and obesity is increasing. What are the steps that you are taking to make citizens healthy and to tackle undernutrition and obesity? Right. <laughs> You're on. So, thank you, Lila. Uh, I think it's very important to first realize the unique context that most of the fast growing cities of India are in right now. So for the last, say, 10 to 15 years, uh, India has had tremendous growth in terms of industrialization, in terms of people taking up occupations that are concentrated inside the cities. There has been a huge rural to urban migration because of, of course, job opportunities, etc., arising in the cities. Uh, so that urbanization process, for example, if I talk about Gujarat, around 47 to 50 percent of Gujarat's population is now urban, which as opposed to compared to, say, 15 years back, it was much lesser. So now this industrialization has, I think, led to a very huge expanding middle class. So middle class has aspirations. It has a busier lifestyle. It is not living the traditional lifestyle that it was living earlier, maybe a more labor intensive economy. It has moved to, say, white collar jobs, more of a knowledge economy. And the food choices or the food habits that were there earlier that were more suited to, say, a lifestyle that was more you know, physically labor centered has changed. So as rightly the honorable speaker said before me, so there's sort of a dichotomy arising. So there are people who are still malnutrition and there are people who have now just moved into the so-called middle class, has taken the, uh, the lifestyle of a middle class and hence are facing the burden of lifestyle diseases as I would put it. So it includes diabetes, it includes sugar, it includes obesity, the trio as you normally call it. So I think it's time that interventions need to be done, keeping into perspective that the, they have just entered the middle class, but the middle class ethos and the awareness about a middle class lifestyle where you need to have a more rational food choices, focusing on, say, the nutritional content that has to be brought into the psyche of the people. So I think we are doing our bit. We are working on two fronts. We are, uh, as far as awareness is concerned, we have massive campaigns going on regarding food safety, food nutrition. Coming back to your, prob uh, your original question of, say, uh, the obesity and the lifestyle changes. So one way we are trying to create awareness on the other hand, we are also creating a lot of infrastructure that promotes a healthy lifestyle. We have the concept of walkable streets now. We are trying to make neighborhoods where everything is on a walking distance to promote walking. We are uh, developing public parks with open air gymnasium on a massive scale. Rajkot currently has close to 155 parks that have open air gymnasiums. Uh, the bylaws, the building bylaws of the state uh, recently in 2018 were amended that every school needs minimum 800 square meters of playground to inculcate healthy habits in children. We are uh, uh, massively uh, investing into public sports infrastructure. Right now, Rajkot, I can say uh, in the western part of Gujarat that Rajkot is, uh, you know, located in, we have about 22 uh, public sports facilities and two to three of them are world class. We have around seven to eight public swimming pools, Olympic sized. We have uh, uh, Olympic level walking tracks, racing tracks with us. So we are investing heavily on sports infrastructure. Another two, inf uh, two sporting hostels are in making. Uh, coming to the enforcement part, we have FSSAI rules, for example, high fat, high sugar uh, commodities should not be sold in the vicinities of schools. So we are 
that uh, we have FSSAI standards as far as edible foods fit for human consumption foods are there. We have uh, on wheels testing laboratories that go and test around shops as to the standard of food that is being said, uh, sold. Uh, sidely, one more concept I think that is very uh, you know peculiar of Indian city especially where there is a busier lifestyle. The central business district is costly as far as the living costs are concerned. So there is a lot of commute involved. Mm. So and uh, say uh, people are commuting. So the concept of street food emerges a lot. So people start eating out on the streets. You have roadside eating joints where maybe the enforcement of the safety standards is slightly difficult because they are more mobile, they are more fluid, their location is not fixed. You cannot really track the source from where they are sourcing their ingredients or their raw materials. So this uh, one concept we have come up of hygienic food streets. So we designate an area, we have all licensing requirements, all registration requirements put into place and we popularize it a lot. So people also get it into their minds, is, suppose I want a quick bite which is cheap, which is on my way to work. Let me look for a hygienic food street. So it's cheap roadside food, but with all the hygiene requirements put into place. Mm. So we have developed three hygienic food streets as of now in Rajkot. We are further expanding it. So, I mean, uh, and now coming to the last, but I think the medical and the most important medical intervention. We uh, traditionally, the... Uh, area of say lifestyle diseases was never much into focus as far as in the Indian context I can say. So recently uh, we had a Niramaya Gujarat program launched which focuses solely on lifestyle disorders, non-communicable lifestyle diseases and about we have uh, large uh, routine screening rounds in which we screen our population for say lifestyle diseases. We have empaneled laboratories for testings. And Rajkot roughly has 20 lakhs of population. That's about 2 million people living in the city. So as of now, we have screened about 30% of the population. So diabetic tests, blood tests, BP tests, lifestyle diseases are being screened. So medically also we are intervening. The age cohorts that need to be targeted, the youth, the children, even the adults are being specifically screened and monitors as far as Niramaya Gujarat is concerned. So I think awareness, creating proper infrastructure, creating uh, timely medical interventions. I think we are trying our best to work on all the three fronts. So I think uh, that's what Rajkot is doing. And I think uh, uh, in say a year or two, the effects of all these interventions will start to show. Mm, wow. And I think a lot of the challenges you've mentioned there that Rajkut is experiencing is probably uh, familiar to a lot of the cities here. And well, you're doing so much, it sounds fantastic. I particularly love the hygienic food streets because what you're doing there is you're keeping the culture of street food, which is such an important part of of so many people's lives, but you're, you're, you're transforming it into something that would benefit the citizens more. So I think that's wonderful. And then the, the awareness um, projects, the infrastructure to promote the walking and the outdoor exercise, uh, playgrounds, public sport, it's fantastic. So thanks so much for sharing that, it's really great. Um, Dr. Varney from Birmingham, woohoo! The, uh, so the city of Birmingham has been one of the childhood obesity trailblazer program delivery partners in England, which means you guys have been trying to tackle childhood obesity at a local level. Can you share some of the bold things that Birmingham has been doing to tackle that issue? Sure. So when we uh, talked about childhood obesity, what we didn't want to do was go, this is all about weight management. This is about putting children into diet programs because the reality is that's just sticking a plaster over the problem. 
So we stepped back from that and we said, looking at what we've learned from being part of the Milan Food Pact, from the Delice Network, working with Pune in India, we need to think whole system. And um, we're delighted to have been working with academics and the Mandela Partnership. So we've got an academic consortium kind of testing us, challenging us, looking at what we're doing. So the first question was, well, do we really understand food in our city? And unfortunately, that's one of our biggest challenges is uh, it's very, very hard to see the data. We talk about obesity. We can measure obesity really well in cities. We have lots of programs across the world where we measure how much excess weight people have. But when you ask, how do we know what people are eating? Mm. How do we know what they're throwing away? That is much, much harder to do at a city level. So the first step was looking at actually, can we start to explore with commercial partners how to understand the retail environment? What is it that is being sold in our supermarkets? And how do we start to conceptualize that? So that was our first strand of work. Our second strand was planning and using the legal levers. So similar to, to in India and, and into the regions there, the cities are using um, planning levers and licensing to say, we want to have food safer zones around schools and around leisure centers. So we've had that in place for a while. But the problem for that was that's around new build. So we can, we can enact that legislation if someone comes for the first time to ask for a fast food license. What we can't do is retrofit it. So if you bought a, a took over a fast food venue, you'd inherit that license. Mm. And the planning guidance doesn't allow me to intervene at that point. It's only if you are completely brand new that I can do something about it. Right. So that was our second strand about building and, and building a, a healthy food environment in the city through commercial uh, levers and looking at what can we do with business incentives, what can we do working with the trade sector. Um, you know, we're a global city. I mean, do have a balti, but do grab some of the other wonderful global food in the city. It's probably, you know, we have every Commonwealth country have a population here in Birmingham and pretty much every one of them have a restaurant as well. So you really can eat the world here, which is brilliant. The third element, though, was around jobs and skills. And this was the bit that when we got the funding, people kind of went, well, you're talking about childhood obesity. Why are you talking about jobs and skills? Why aren't you talking about public education? And we said, well, we're doing the public education. Let's, you know, but that's not what we're seeing as a problem. What we're seeing as a problem is that the food industry has never had the investment that science and technology has. You know, when we look at what we're investing in, food is a fundamental part of our society. We celebrate with it, we mourn with it. Unfortunately, culturally, we celebrate with generally the most unhealthy things we can find of cake and chocolate. <laughs> um, but it is a really, really important part of the economy. Yet when you look at the investment in the skills and the jobs, these are generally low paid jobs, they're low skill and they're underdeveloped. And if we want to have a healthy food system, we need to change that. So working with the universities of the city, working with the business sector of the city, we're unpacking that and saying to businesses, what's it going to take? What do you need for us to do with education to train people so that they come out of school being able to create healthy food and create an environment that makes food affordable, accessible, safe and delicious? And those are the kind of three elements of the Childhood Obesity Programme, which is nested within our wider kind of food strategy, looking at food affordability and food justice. But it's trying to say, if we demonise children, if we demonise families by making childhood obesity about the decisions that they make. And we fail to discuss that those decisions are restrained and disabled by the environment around them in the city, then we are never gonna tackle these issues. Mm. And that's why we were bold and brave in kind of going, actually, the issue of childhood obesity is not the child and the family. The issue is the city they live in. Yes, I think that's, yeah, that is such an incredible point and I think very important because there is a risk of, uh, as you say, demonizing people for the decisions they make. But if the environment that they live in, i.e. the city, is the thing that is sort of funneling them towards making those uh, poor life choices, it's kind of not their fault, it's the city. So that's, that's an amazing thing that that, that that bigger picture is being addressed. Um, I read recently the Broken Plates report by Food Foundation, which um, had some statistics uh, that I found shocking. 
about the UK. Um, childhood obesity has risen by 50% in the past year in the UK, 5-0 within one year, which I thought was amazing. And poor nutrition is actually causing stunted growth here in the UK. Five-year-olds are shorter in the UK than, in, than their counterparts in the rest of Europe. And there is actually height variation between children in different parts of the UK, be they poorer parts or more wealthy parts, which I just think is kind of incredible for as someone who is from the UK and consider this country to be advanced and, and developed, that we are having issues which are global issues that are being seen across so many cities, which is why I think it's so great that we are hearing from voices from different cities to understand how different cities are addressing what is essentially similar problems that are everywhere. I mean, just to build on that, I think one of the most powerful conversations we've had in Birmingham, and it picks up to your point about kind of middle class aspirations and how you, in cities we, we're very focused on economic growth. We want to be successful, we want to be proud, and I'm incredibly proud of Birmingham. But we have some really dark corners, and they're not just dark corners. Between one in three and one in four of our children live in poverty. And for those families, every day, their parents go through the shame and the tension of knowing, can they feed their child, or can they clothe their child, or can they heat their house? And as the minister was saying, you know, we are heading into a really difficult period. Families in Birmingham will have to choose whether to heat or eat. And as a municipal administration, that's really difficult. What can we do in what is a global crisis to buffer that? But the first thing we can do is talk about it. And sitting in a, in a group, in one of our development groups, our partnership groups, and being open about our experiences and individuals of food poverty, the time when I had, as a student, ran out of money and for two weeks lived on broken biscuits. And, and now I can talk about it without tears in my eyes, but I still feel the shame of the point at which I had to ring my parents and go, I've really messed up my life. I'm in a real state and I cannot afford to feel myself. I was lucky, that was two weeks of my life. For many of our citizens, that is every day. And we do not talk about that as a society. Mm. So we've also got to talk about food and the difficult bits of food, not just the wonderful bits of food, because mm -hmm. it's brilliant to celebrate the global food industry we have in Birmingham. But we've got to talk about the fact that for many people, they can't afford that. Mm. And how do we change that through what we do on poverty, but also how do we work with the food system so that a coffee in Starbucks does not cost a week's wage? And we also have to be honest that you know, we can't outrun a chocolate bar. We won't solve these things by diverting the conversation, which is often what happens, into alternative things. We have to be brutally honest about the reality of food in our world and how much that is a challenge for citizens in high-income countries and in low-income countries. Mm. This is a global conversation, and it's one we need to start having much more openly. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, Maybe you could both talk about a little bit about the challenges that you are facing in the in these in the work and the and the new efforts and the initiatives that you are undertaking. What are the main challenges? See, I think uh, there are two three things. First, uh, Rajkot. I'll, I'll talk about Rajkot uh, in particular. Mm -hmm. Rajkot is the commercial centre of about thirteen districts of Gujarat. So the first thing that, you know, the first challenge that comes to you is land availability mm -hmm. and land pricing. Now, most of the initiatives, they want, like uh, uh, Justin said, they want intervention at the time when they are starting. Once you have passed the, you have missed the initial bus, mm -hmm. it's very difficult to intervene at a later stage. Mm. So... Considering Rajkot with the real estate prices rising, the land prices rising, the population pressure increasing, the in-migration. So planning really takes a back seat if you delay it even by some time. So 
to act really fast, to act at the right moment, to act at the point of inception is the first key. Mm. Secondly, I think uh, that acceptance in people as to why I am supposed to choose a healthy alternative over a cheaper one, that awareness is still we need to work on. Third, I think, uh, like uh, uh, Justin again, he pointed out that food and food safety has to become the mainstream dialogue, the seriousness, the importance and the penalties, how much we penalize as and when there is a violation that needs to be looked on a much serious scale. And that you have to create. And I think we all live in a democracy. So first thing, if you want any change, you want to create a public demand for it. Any initiative to succeed in a democracy has to arise out of a public demand. And with a fluid population and incoming population, that is where we, you know, that is somehow somewhat a sort of the biggest hurdle. So you want to bring in a planning regulation that promotes a more healthier lifestyle but it is less efficient when it comes to spatial planning so that acceptance that awareness generation i think that's the biggest hurdle and once that settles it into the psyche of the people i think it would be much easier from there on mm. i think Just from a, a birmingham perspective i i think the the point of cities sit within regions you and and bluntly most farming does not happen in a city so you you have to work in partnership and you know, certainly in the ukraine and i know across the world the ukraine uh, crisis most of us did not know how much wheat ukraine produced and how essential it was to the system um, and that has really, I think, opened people's eyes up to understanding that this is a global discussion and that cities have to engage in the global discussion because we are the economic hubs. We're where the trade happens, where the connections happen. And if we're not round the table and this just happens at member state level, then we're kind of left out. And, and when you're looking at, at a national level, and in a previous role I worked nationally uh, in England, um, some things make a lot of sense, but when you get down to the level of a city, it doesn't quite work in the same way. Um, and that is one of the challenges, but it's one of the advantages of working with the Food Foundation uh, and with DEFRA and our Dep Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs uh, and our Department for Health and Social Care. This is a cross-government conversation. Um, we were very lucky in Birmingham to host the launch of the National Food Conversation with Henry Dimbleby. And I know the Food Programme have been really supportive of this. Um, that's part of the conversation that Amit was alluding to, that we've got to have the conversation, we've got to bring people with us on the journey. If we simply say we're going to change the portion size or we're going to force you so that all the high sugar drinks are at the bottom of the fridge and we're going to regulate for that, people don't come with us. And, and then you get rebellion and rebellion then feeds people's habits, etc. So the conversations have been a really important part of this, but they're time consuming. We're lucky in Birmingham, we're big enough, we've invested in a brilliant food team who, wave your hands, food team, please. This is my brilliant team who have helped work with the Food Foundation on this conference, who've developed our strategy. We are one, I think, of only about four cities in the UK who have a dedicated food team. I know Milan have expanded their food team recently. If we're going to do this, which we have to do, We've got to put the resource in it. And that is probably the biggest challenge of cities understanding that dealing with the food system needs dedicated people. And those people need to work in a really matrix way and really engage in the partnership because system working takes people. Mm. And, as, and as you both alluded to, any change that you want, you need, you need to get the, the public yes. on board for it to, to affect a national level, yeah. And that's, the, you know, now, and, and it seems, hard, I, you know, I, I think about how I phrase this, but you, you have to make the best of horrible situations. And the opportunity from a food system perspective of the current disruption of the global food systems, of the challenges we have of cost of living, this is a unique time for us to talk to citizens 
about what food means to them and what the world of food they want to see for the future. Because over the next six months, in every city across the world, citizens will be thinking really carefully about how they spend money on food, what they put on their plate, and what they throw away or they recycle and upcycle in food. We've never really had that moment in history. It's been about affluence, it's been about spending and, and aspirational food. We're now moving into a space where food scarcity and food challenges will allow us to really have those honest conversations. Mm. And I'm just adding to it, we never really know which global factor would mm -hmm. affect what. You talked about, you know, spending habits on food. And it, there are a number of researches that have shown that when, uh, you know, uh, a sort of uh, economic cut down happens on any family, the first thing that takes a hit are the food choices. Mm -hmm. Mm. So, for example, there was the Russia-Ukraine war. Now, the steel prices rose, the cement prices rose. First thing that took a hit was the construction industry. So, that affected a lot of people engaged in construction labor. That had a domino effect. That, again, impacted how much the commerce was flowing. Once you have public infrastructure, public spending, the investment into real estate going down, a lot of commercial activities decline. That has a domino effect on a lot of people. Mm. So I think he was pretty right. We have to have a dialogue on a global scale. We have to understand the interdependencies that exist, not just amongst nations or countries, but amongst sectors. Mm. So I think uh, we need to expand the dialogue. We, from food safety, we need to really go to food security. Mm. And I think uh, initiatives like this should, you know, at least propel the thoughts that are required. Mm. Well, I mean, fascinating and insightful first panel discussion. Please give a round of applause for Dr. Justin and Aurora.